العلم أشراف مطلب وطالبه لله أكرام من يمشي على قادم العلم نور مبين يستضيء به أهل السعادات والجهال في الظلم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين <coughs> أما بعد So the last um, masala that we took was the issue of the sutra. Um, and today we'll resume from the niyyah, inshallah. We'll start from the niyyah. The Sheikh says, Rahimahullah, Wala Buddha, what Sheikh says this? Sheikh Al Bani. Sheikh Muhammad Nasir Adin Al Bani, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, Rahmatun Wasi'a. Yakul Sheikh, Wala Buddha Lil Musalli, Min An Yamwi Al Salat, and Leti. قام إليها وتعيينها وتعيينها بقلبه كفرد ظهر كفرد ظهر والعصر أو العصر أو سنها أو سنتها مثلا وهو شرد أو ركن وأما تلفظ بها بلسانه فبدعة مخالفة للسنة ولم يقل بها أحد من متبوعي المقلدين من الأئمة The next مسألة that the Sheikh رحمه الله is talking about is you've come into the masjid, you've taken a sutra, you've done all of your wudu and everything, and then you come into the masjid. Now you're about to start. The very most important thing, the first and most important thing that you need to have is the correct niyyah, correct intention for when you want to do any ibadah. And the intention is of two types. Intention is of two types. The first type is niyatul ma'muli lahu the intention of who you're doing the act of ibadah for the intention of who you're doing the ibadah for niyatul ma'muli lahu and the intention for that should be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you intend with your salah to be fulfilling an obligation you're fulfilling an obligation Put it back. You're fulfilling an obligation And you're doing it solely and sincerely For Allah subhanahu <coughs> For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone And that is what is called Al-ikhlas Sincerity for any time you want to do a ibadah, it has to meet two conditions. Any time that you want to do any ibadah, whether it's salah, hajj, zakah, fasting, whatever ibadah it may be, it needs to meet two conditions. First, it must be done for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if a person billah, is doing it to show off, to be praised and so on, then that is a corrupt intention. And that person will be sinning for that ibadah or that intent that intention let alone being rewarded for it so that is the first the second condition is obviously it has to be in accordance with the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam this so that that was the first type of intention what is the first type of intention 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 of who you're doing it for who you're doing the ibadah for a allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the second type of intention, which is the one also being referred to here, is niyatul amal. When you intend the actual amal, the actual ibadah itself, whether it's salat al dhuhr, salat al fajr, salat al asr, isha, you have to have the intention for the salah that you wish to pray. So now, when we're about to stand for salat al isha, when we're standing and we're saying Allahu Akbar, we need to have the intention that we're going to pray Salatul Isha. What does this mean? This means that if a person is standing with us and they're sitting next to us and they say Allahu, or they're standing next to us in the Salah and they say Allahu Akbar and they intend Salatul Maghrib, they think we're praying Salatul Maghrib, although we're going to stand for Salatul Isha very soon, but they think we're what? Praying Salatul Maghrib. So they started the Salah with the intention of Salatul Maghrib. Even if they pray four rak'at, their Salah is invalid. 
Why is it invalid? Because the intention that they had was that it was for, it was Maghrib that they were praying. So they need to what? Repeat that Salah again. They need to repeat al isha again. طيب. So the Sheikh says, Rahimahullah, Wala Buddha lil Musalli is an incumbent or wajib for the Muslim that wants to pray, that they intend for the Salah, the Salah that they are praying there, there and then. بِقَلْبِهِ with his heart, the Sheikh says, Rahimahullah, in his heart. Why is the Sheikh saying this? Because he's telling us that you don't need to say, I intend to pray four rak'at. No way to an usalli arba rak'at. You don't have to say it. In that, in, you, you don't need to utter these words. And you will often find that sometimes when you're praying next to elders or certain people, you will find that even before they salat, they say the salat, they say, on the way to an usalli arba rak'at in hadir and fulan. خلف إمام كذا. And they are saying out their intention, but they don't need to say out the intention. Because when you leave your home, or when you make wudu from the get-go, when you make wudu, and you leave your masjid, you leave your home, and you walk into the masjid, and you get into the road, all of that is a sign of your intention. All of that is a sign that you've got the intention. So one of the things that the scholars mention in this point is they say, don't stress yourself too much with regards to the intention. Because if you do so, then it can lead to wiswas. So you say, Allahu Akbar. And then you might find the person leaving the salah, saying, SubhanAllah, what did I intend? Let me intend a shah. Allahu Akbar. Oh, no, I forgot to say, I intend to pray. Allahu Akbar. And you find them constantly repeating that. So they don't need to do that. Because the fact that they've walked to the masjid and made wudu is a sign that they intend to pray the salah. So they don't need to utter these words. The Sheikh says, وَهُوَ شَغْدٌ أَوْ رُكُنْ It is a shagd or, or a rukun. Why does the Sheikh say it is a condition or a pillar? Although we know that a pillar and a condition, there's a big difference between the two. So like, why does Sheikh Al-Bani say, وَهُوَ شَغْدٌ أَوْ رُكُنْ وَهُوَ شَغْدٌ أَوْ رُكُنْ Okay, something closer than that. There are some madhabs that say the intention is a shag, it's a condition. And there are those that say it is a pillar. Why do they say it's an intention? Because they say it's outside of the salah and you're standing. Others say that it's within the salah. So it is a condition, it is a pillar from the pillars of the salah. <coughs> so the Sheikh wanted to mention that some say this and some say that, like in it's this. It, Although they differ, it doesn't really make a difference because at the end of the day, you still need to have the intention. And then he says, as for uttering the words and saying, I intend to pray however many rak'at, then that is a bid'ah, he says. That is a bid'ah that contradicts the sunnah. And how do we know if something is a bid'ah and if something is a sunnah? If it has been narrated in the Quran and the sunnah, or in the sunnah of the Prophet, then it is a sunnah. If it hasn't, been narrated in the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and a person intends to get closer to Allah with this then it is a bid'ah because they're intending to get closer to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala with something that the Prophet did not do Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam The next masala the Shaykh says at takbir Now the Shaykh is obviously we've started the Salah or we're about to start the Salah He's going to talk about how do we start the Salah How do we start the Salah The Shaykh says Rahimahullah ثُمَّ يَسْتَفْتِحُ الصَّلَاةَ بِقَوْلِهِ Then he starts off his salah with his statement اللَّهُ أَكْبَرُ وَهُوَ رُكْنٌ So he says, first and foremost, you have to say Allahu Akbar. Secondly, you have to know that it is a pillar. First and foremost, Allahu Akbar in those words. Allahu Akbar with those two words. Why? Because that's how it has been narrated from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Messenger وسلم, said to the companion that walked into the masjid who he was teaching, إِذَا قُمْتَ إِلَى الصَّلَاةِ فَكَبِّرْ If you stand for the salah, then say Allahu Akbar. What does this mean? It means that we can't say Allahu Aziz, Allahu Azim. We can't say that. Nor can we say Allahu Akbar. It has to be Allahu Akbar. Because when you say, or the meaning of Allahu Akbar, Allah is the greatest. 
But when you say, Allahu Akbar, that is a question. You ask him, is Allah the greatest? Ilahum ma'Allah. Do you not see that in the Quran? So when you're saying, Allahu Akbar, and that is a haram word to, to use because you're saying, is there, is Allah the greatest? That's what you're saying. And that is not what has been narrated in this position because you're meant to say, Allahu Akbar. Also, questions after you. <coughs> also, you can't say Allahu Akbar. Sometimes you hear some imam saying that. Allahu Akbar. Because bar means a drum. That's what it means in, in, in Arabic. So you say Allahu Akbar. Then the shaykh says, Wahu Ruknun. And it is a pillar. Why is he telling us it is a pillar? Because in the introduction he said that every issue he mentions, he's going to say whether it's a pillar or whether it is a wajib, it is compulsory or whether it is, it is a sunnah. So when he's saying wa huwa ruknun and it is a pillar, in reality he is telling you you cannot leave it off. You must perform this pillar. As a general qa'id, as a general principle, write down all pillars must be performed. All pillars must be performed in the salah. So even if a person forgets a pillar, they need to go back and repeat it. طيب, so the Sheikh says, لقوله, because of the statement of the Prophet وسلم, The key of the salah to go into the salah is tahur. Why? Because just like you use a key to enter a room, you use tahara purification to enter your salah. Then he said, وسلم, And what makes it haram is the takbir. What makes what haram? Everything that was previously halal for you to do, okay for you to do, is no longer okay for you to do. For example, to talk. Now when you're sitting down, is it permissible or is it haram? Permissible. permissible. To eat and drink, is it permissible or not? Permissible. Like in, in the salah, are you allowed to eat and drink? No. So it makes it haram. وَتَحْلِيلُهَا taslim. And what makes it halal is, meaning what makes all of these things halal again, is the taslim, saying Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. <coughs> then the Shaykh says, Rahimahullah, <coughs> وَلَا يَرْفَعُ صَوْتَهُ بِالتَّكْبِيرِ فِي كُلِّ الصَّلَوَاتِ إِلَّا إِذَا كَانَ إِمَامًا The next message that the Shaykh says, is saying is, and you shouldn't raise your, you shouldn't raise your voice, when you're saying Allahu Akbar in every single salah. Illa idha kan imaman. Unless the person is an imam. So we understand from there that if a person, you're either one of three. You're either the imam and there are people praying behind you or you are praying alone or you're praying behind people. Is understood? These three scenarios. And we're going to use these scenarios throughout the lesson. So if you're the Imam, the Sheikh says, Rahimahullah, you need to raise your hand, you need to raise your voice. So Allahu Akbar, when you want to start the Salah. Why is that? Because there are people praying behind you, and those that are praying behind you, they need to hear that you've started the Salah, or whether you've started the Salah or not. As for if you're praying alone, you don't need to raise your voice. You can say Allahu Akbar, but you don't need to raise your voice. And also, if you're praying behind the Imam, and you're praying in the rows behind the Imam, for example, again, you don't raise your voice. You say, Allahu Akbar. And this is a common mistake by a lot of Musallin, where as soon as the Imam says, Allahu Akbar, they say, Allahu Akbar, and they get confused. Some of the other people may get confused. Is that the Imam that just said, Allahu Akbar, or is it someone else that said, Allahu Akbar? And that will cause the people themselves that are praying behind the Imam to confuse one another. Imagine if everyone says Allahu Akbar out loud, they're going to confuse one another. So if you're the Imam, the Shaykh is saying, Rahimahullah, you raise your voice. Lacking if you're praying behind an Imam, or if you're praying on your own, then you say just about enough to hear yourself, so that you can hear, you can hear yourself. Lacking the next masala is, it is important that you say Allahu Akbar. You can't say, and you can't say, I said it with my mind, I said it in my head. You can't say, Look towards me, you can't say without moving your lips. You can't do that. Why? Because the Messenger 
in all of his prayers, every time he prayed, he would say Allahu Akbar and he would utter the word Allahu Akbar. So you can't say I'm saying it in my head. Just like when you're reading and we shall see in the lesson today, you can't say Allahu Akbar. I'm reading the Fatiha in my head. La. You can't say that. You need to say it with your, you need to actually say it with the moving of your lips. You need to say it with the moving of your lips. طيب. The next message the Sheikh says, ويجوز تبليغ المؤذن تكبير الإمام إلى الناس إذا وجد المقتضي لذلك <laughs> كما قد الإمام وضع في صوته وكثرة أو كثرة المصلين خلفه. The next message the Sheikh is talking about is, or the next issue is, he's saying that if the Imam is leading the Salah and the people behind him cannot hear his voice. For example, let's say the microphone breaks during the Salah or the electricity goes off. So the people in the front of the, in the back of the masjid may not hear the imam. So what is permissible? Someone in the middle or someone behind the imam, praying behind the imam or somewhere in the middle, can relay the takbir on to the people behind the imam. To the, or to the people behind him or to the people around him. So this masala is called tabligh. Where your if, a, if the people behind, praying behind the Imam cannot hear the Imam, you take it upon yourself. It could be the Imam, it could be the Mu'addin, the one that called the Adhan, or it could be anyone else in the, in, in, in the Masjid. But it has to be someone who has got, loud, got a loud voice. So they can say, Allahu Akbar, when the Imam says. And then when the Imam says, Sami Allahu liman hamada, they say, Sami Allahu liman hamada. Why? So that the people in the back can hear. Or even the people in behind the Imam can hear. Whether it's just his voice that is weak or that is low, or whether the electricity have, has gone off, or whether he is ill, or whether there's a lot of people in the masjid. Whether there's a lot of people in the masjid. <coughs> in any case, it is permissible to do that. And Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu used to do that when he prayed behind the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's salt or his voice was low due to illness. Then the Sheikh says, وَلَا يُكَبِّرُ الْمَأْمُومُ إِلَّا عَقِبَ إِنْتِهَاءِ الْإِمَامِ مِنَ الْإِمَامِ مِنَ التَّكْبِيرِ He's still talking about the takbir. Now he's telling us, yes, the Imam has already said Allahu Akbar. When should the one praying behind the Imam say Allahu Akbar? He says, عَقِبَ إِنْتِهَاءِ الْإِمَامِ When the Imam says Allahu Akbar, then you say Allahu Akbar. What does this mean? It means that if, if the Imam says Allah, you can't say Allahu Akbar. Why? Because you may even start the Salah before him. So you're meant to follow the Imam. You're not, you're not meant to precede the Imam. And you're not meant to delay it too long as well. So you, the Imam can't say Allahu Akbar. If the Imam says Allahu Akbar, you don't need to wait a few minutes to say Allahu Akbar. No. As soon as the Imam says Allahu Akbar and they finish what they say in the takbir, khalas. Then you start the salah. Then you start the salah. Because if you say it before him, you may start the salah even before him. And that is incorrect. طيب. The next masala the shaykh says is رَفْعُ الْيَدَيْنِ وَكَيْفِيَةِ رَفْعُ الْيَدَيْنِ وَكَيْفِيَةُ How to raise the hands and how it is done. Or raising the hands and how it is done. There are five masail, five issues. Just as a summary, there are five issues that the Shaykh will mention, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. Or there's four, no, there's about three masail that he will mention, like and I'm going to add on about two. That makes it five. So write these as they are. Number one, putting the right hand on top of, <coughs> on top of the left hand. The next masala, the second issue is how to put the right hand on top of the left hand. We shall see there are three ways. So just after that, right times three, because there are three ways. Number three, where should the hands be placed when standing in the salah? Where should the hands be placed when standing in salah? Where should the hands be placed when standing in Salah? The next masala, number four, sah? No. Where should the hands be placed after Rukur? A 
and number five in which positions should the hand be raised should the hands be raised during the salah and there are four positions in which the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam or four situations where the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam raised his hands in the salah طيب. let's start with the words of the shaykh يقول الشيخ رحمه الله ويرفع يديه مع التكبير او قبله او بعده كل ذلك ثابت في السنه so he says rahimahullah the muslim when he's about to pray he can raise his hands the same time as allahu akbar so there are three ways that he's teaching us that you can say that allahu akbar and the hand the connection between or the relation between the hands and the saying of allahu akbar so he says wa yarfa yadayhi ma'a takbir he can say allahu akbar is that understood allahu akbar so i'm raising my hands and saying Allahu Akbar at the same time. Is that understood? Then the Shaykh says, Oh, Qablahu, or before it, before what? Before the Takbirat al Haram. So I say, Allahu Akbar. So the second scenario is what? <coughs> Raising my hands before saying Takbirat al Haram. Watch me. Look. Allahu Akbar. Which one did I raise first? The hands. Or بعدahu, or after it, after what? After takbirat al-haram. So you say, Allahu Akbar. All have been narrated from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. كل ذلك ثابت في السنة. And all of that has been narrated in the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. How many positions? Three. What are they? During, before and after. During, Allahu Akbar. Before, Allahu Akbar. Or, Allahu Akbar. طيب. ويرفعهما ممدودة تاني الأصابع ويجعل كفيه حذو من كبيه وأحيانا يبالغ في رفعهما حتى يحاذي بهما أطراف أذنه. The next message the Shaykh is saying, رحمه الله. طيب. You've said to raise your hand, صح? Ya Shaykh Al-Bani Rahimakallah, how should we raise our hands? He says there are two ways. There are two ways of raising the hands. Obviously it has to be facing the Qibla, your hands have to be facing the Qibla. You can either make it level with your shoulders, say Allahu Akbar, level with your shoulders, or slightly higher whereby they level with your ears. Allahu Akbar. Two ways. The first, that they level, your hands are level with your shoulders. Allahu Akbar. Or, they can be level with your ears. Allahu Akbar. These are the two ways that the Shaykh says, Rahimahullah ta'ala rahmatan wasi'ah. However, he also mentions that, as for what a lot of people do, whereby they touch their ears, or they go like this, that hasn't been narrated in the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He says, Rahimahullah, that hasn't been narrated in the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And if the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did do it, then the Sahaba would have narrated it. Bear in mind the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or the companions, they narrated to us how the Prophet ate, how the Prophet slept, the du'as that he would read, how he walked, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, how he performed hajj, how he prayed. So it is impossible that they would have missed out a detail like putting the hands on the ears. So there are two ways of raising the hand, or you can raise them in two levels. What are those two levels? Level with your shoulders or level with your ears without touching your ears. طيب. The next message the Sheikh says, وَدْعُ الْيَدَيْنِ وَكَيْفِ طَيْبِ ثُمَّ يَضَعُ يَدَهُ الْيُمْنَى عَلَى يُسْرَ عَقِبَ التَّكْبِيرِ وَهُوَ مِنْ سُنَنِ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ وَأَمَرَ بِهِ أصحابه فلا يجوز استعلمه. طيب. What was the first مسألة? Put in the right hand. نعم. So this is the مسألة that the Sheikh is talking about. This is the issue that he's talking about. Now, he says as soon as you say Allahu Akbar, remind me, inshallah, during the last lesson, maybe the last half an hour, I'll try doing a practical example of all of this <coughs> once we finish the other parts of the salah. So the Sheikh is saying, رحمه الله, the Sunnah is or what is wajib is that when you're praying and you've said Allahu Akbar that you put your right hand 
on your left hand. Your right hand on your left hand. He says, Wahu Sunnul Anbiya. Sunnul Anbiya. It is the Sunnah of all of the Anbiya. It is the way, the path of all of the Anbiya. And the Prophet وسلم, said, Inna ma'ashar al Anbiya, umirna an ajil al fit iftara, wa nuakhir suhurana, wa nada imanin aymanana, ala shama ilana fi salah. Our us messengers, our pro, us prophets, meaning the Prophet and all of the other Prophets, السلام, we've been commanded to hasten the iftar when we're breaking our fast and to delay the suhoor and to also put our right hands on top of our left hands. Our, we've been commanded to put our le- right on top of our left. Also, the Prophet وسلم, came past the companion who was praying like this and he prevented him and he put his right hand on top of his left hand. So that is the first mas'ala, which is that you put your right hand on top of your left hand. That's the first mas'ala done, sah? The next mas'ala, وَيَدْعُ الْيُمْنَ عَلَى ظَهْرِ الْيُسْرَى وَعَلَى رُسْغِ وَعَسَّاعِدِ وَتَارَةً يَقْبِدُ بِالْيُمْنَ عَلَى يُسْرَى The next mas'ala the Shaykh says, rahimahullah, is with regards to what was the last mas'ala? Right. Putting your right hand on top of your left hand. But how? There are three ways that have been narrated in the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And these three ways are putting the right hand on top of the left hand, like that. The right on top of the left. The right palm on top of the left. Like that. That's the first way to hold the hand or to put the right on top of the left the next is to hold القبض, as the sheikh says to hold like that like that where you're holding you're actually holding your wrist that is called القبض. from the wrist or the hand Over here where you put your watch like that so you've got a part of your forearm and a part of your wrist as well. And the third is to put your hand on your forearm. Like that, like that, like that. So these are the three scenarios that the Shaykh says, Rahimahullah <coughs> ta'ala To put your hand, right hand on top of your left hand. The wrist, the right hand on top of the left wrist, like that. Or to hold, or to put your hand on top of your left arm. So the sunnah is to do this and to do that. Do three, all three at different times. Because that has been narrated from the Prophet ﷺ. This way, this method and that method. And if you ever find in the sunnah that more than one method or one dua has been mentioned, then try to combine all of these different methods. Because in reality, you're combining all of the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that is the what masala? Number two. The third is makanu wat al Where to put the hands? Where to put the hands? The Shaykh says, Rahimahullah, وَيَدْعُهُمَا عَلَى صَدْرِهِ فَقَدْ And he puts the hands on top of his chest. The man and the woman are exactly the same in this. And the women, men and women are exactly the same in all of the ahkam of the sharia, except if there's something to specify them. Or if there's some, unless there's something to exempt, uh, uh, exclude, them, exclude the women and include the women only. Or that specifies the men. So the ahkam, or the rulings of the sharia, are of three types, in general, just as a side benefit. There's that which is khas birrijal, it is specific to men. For example, jihad, for example, leading the salah, for example, governing. The second is that which is khas bin nisa, that are specific to women. For example, women being allowed to wear gold, beautification, rulings pertaining to beautification, rulings pertaining to the time of the month where they're not fasting or praying. So these are specific to the women, hijab and so on and so forth. 
Then there are ahkam, rulings that are general between, that relate to the men and the women. For example, salah, praying. For example, hajj, zakah, fasting. طيب. So the shaykh says, rahimahullah, and he puts, puts the hand on the chest, puts his hands on his chest. And the reason is, or the reason why the shaykh says that, rahimahullah, because there are some hadith that he declared authentic and some of the scholars also declared authentic. طيب. Stating that the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa put his hands on his chest. Is understood. So that is the reason why the Shaykh is saying, Rahimahullah, وَيَدْعُهُمَا عَلَىٰ صَدِقِهِ فَقَدْ To put the hands on top, on one's chest. And the chest is anywhere, is from there to there. طيب. Again, that is based on the Shaykh, Rahimahullah, authenticating or grading the hadith relating to that to be sahih. طيب. And there are obviously other scholars that also declare that those hadith to be sahih. Then there are other scholars who also declare those hadith to be weak. They're not authentically, they cannot be authentically attributed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So based on that second opinion, those scholars will say that you can put your hand anywhere as long as you're holding it up. It can be on the chest, they say, on, your, on top of the belly button, on the belly button. So there are these two opinions amongst the Ahlul Sunnah, and these opinions are spread out amongst the Madahib. So there are those that say a person puts his hands on his chest because these hadith are authentic. And if these hadith are authentic, then it means that that is from the Sunnah of the Prophet Then there are those that say that these hadith, they're not authentic. Each hadith on its own is not authentic. Therefore, whether you put it here, whether you put it here, or just on top of the belly button, or on top of the belly button, that is also permissible, they say. So with regards to this, it's, it's kind of easy. Wherever a person puts his hand, inshallah, the person would be rewarded. The most important thing is they put their right hand, on top of their left hand. Like in just as a side mas'ala, there's an issue relating to tagbiyah and it relating to, that relates to the khilaf that you see amongst scholars and so on and so forth and madahib. If there is a, a respectable opinion in a madhab and it is based upon evidence, then if you see your brother adopting that methodology or that madhab, don't rebuke him and don't condemn, condemn him and don't refute him for it. And don't say, Wallah, you've opposed the Sunnah of the Prophet, you hate the Sunnah of the Prophet wasallam. That. Why? Because these issues give or take. For those scholars that say these are hadith are authentic, then they're going to apply that. Again, for those that say these are hadith are not even authentic, then with what right are you forcing them to take the opinion of a hadith that they don't even believe is authentic? So you can put your hands on your hat, on your chest, or on your belly button, or on your stomach, lacking, do not rebuke those people that do otherwise, and do not make it a, a furqan, يعني, a criterion between the haq and the batil, between the haq and the batil, whereby to say anyone that does it, anyone that puts it on their chest is a bat, is a mubtad, or anyone that does it puts it on the belly button or on the stomach is a mubtad, لا. you cannot say that, and that's important, that we understand this as students of knowledge. If you find the khilaf between Ahlu Sunnah, the people of the Sunnah, between the Madahib, between the scholars, and there's no clear cut evidence, then there's room for khilaf. There's room for khilaf and understanding. طيب. Then the Shaykh says, Rahimahullah, وَيَدْعُمَنَا صَدِيقُ وَرَجُلُ وَالْمَرَةُ فِي ذَلِكَ نَعَمْ So the man and the woman are exactly the same in how they pray. And there are other places where we shall see, whether they're in Ruku', whether they're in Sujood, the way they put their hands is exactly the same, and there's no evidence to say otherwise. Then the Sheikh says, "Wala yajuzu an yada'a yadahu al-yumna ala khasirati." And so now that the Sheikh has taught us where to put our hands, he is saying it is not permissible for the person to put his hand on his waist in the salah. So you can't say Allah Akbar and then go like that. Why? Because that is haram. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam prohibited us from doing it. And there is kibir and haughtiness uh, attributed to this or that surrounds this sort of 
action. So it is not permissible to do. Wal-khushu'u, the next masala. Wal-khushu'u, another ila mawdi'i sujood. Ila mawdi'i sujood. The next masala the Shaykh is talking about is having humility and attentiveness in the salah. Having khushu' in the salah. And khushu' is the core part of the salah. And it can be said, it is the salah. Because with khush, why are we praying? We are praying to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are praying so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can accept our ibadah. We are praying so that our ibadah, our salah, can bring us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are praying so that our salah can have a direct effect on our day-to-day life. In the tanha anil fahshai wal munkar. Verily salah, it stops a person from doing evil and sins. So the salah that stops a person doing evil and sins is the salah that they actually know what they're doing. So khushu' is a very important part of the salah. So the shaykh says, وَعَلَيْهَا يَخْشَعَ فِي صَلَاتِهِ It is wajib upon the Muslim to have or it is incumbent upon the Muslim to have khushu' in their salah. وَأَنْ يَجْتَنِبَ كُلَّ مَا قَدْ يُلْهِهِ عَنْهُ And it's important to stay away from everything that can divert you away, that can prevent you from having khushu' anything that can prevent you from having khushu' then you should avoid min zakharat min zakhari fin wa nuqush fala yusalli bi hadrati ta'am yashtahihi wala wa huwa yudafi'uhu al bawl wal ghail so the sheikh is now saying mentioning a few things that can take your khushu' away and all of these things you should avoid because if you have or if you fall into any of these you won't be able to have khushu' you won't have Tranquility and humility and attentiveness. You may end up reading a surah and you don't even know what surah you read. You may be praying behind the Imam and you don't know what surah he read. That is due to the lack of khushur. So he says it, Rahimahullah. So anything that has some sort of beautification, that should be avoided. That you should not put that in front of you. For example, if there's a TV that is on. You shouldn't pray towards the TV. Don't say, I'm not watching it. Because it will disturb you. The Prophet ﷺ was given a thobe. And the thobe had lines on it. And it prevented him from having khushur in his salah. And he gave it back to Aisha and said, give it back to them and give me something else. Sallallahu alayhi Because it was taken away, his khushur. So the shaykh says, naam. So anything that is, has some sort of beautification or putting du'as on the wall, or putting notifications on the wall and so on and so forth then that can prevent a person from having khushur for example if you get alhamdulillah now they're at the back if you get a book of like a whole library and you put it in the front next to the musallin those people that are praying they're not going to look in the on they're not going to look on the floor they're going to look at what books they are Bukhari, Muslim, maybe. <laughs> they're going to look at the books that are present on the shelf so anything that can prevent a person from having khushur. He says, Rahmatullah Ali, فَلَا يُصَلِّ بِحَضْرَةِ الطَّعَامِ So a person shouldn't pray if food has been brought in front of him and he desires that food. If food has been brought in front of, brought in front of him and he desires that food. So a person may be extremely hungry. For example, he lives close to the masjid. He may be very hungry. He may be very hungry. And then the food gets put in front of him. What happens is, if he goes to the masjid, on his way to the masjid, and in this masjid, and in the salah, he'll be thinking about the food that was put down. He won't have any khushur. So that food has prevented him from having khushur. Therefore, what does he do? He finishes, or he eats what he can, to the extent that the desire goes, and then he goes to the masjid. Right. Like in this isn't a concession to make sure that your food is always brought at the time of eating. This doesn't mean that you should have an agreement with the family that every time the adhan is called that they put the, fam- the food down. So a person should avoid that. This is for once or twice. Like in it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be the case. Also he has to have desire for that food. He has to be hungry. He has to have a desire for that food to the extent that it's taken away his khushur. Like, and if he's not even hungry and he's eating for the sake of it, or it's his second, third meal of the day and he's not really hungry, 
it's if he leaves that and goes to the masjid and he comes back, it's not the end of the world. He doesn't desire that food. So he won't be thinking about that food all the time. طيب. Also, iftar, Ramadan, for example. You can't use this hadith for Ramadan and say that the food has already been brought. Of course the food is going to be brought because it's in front of... You break your fast exactly at iftar. <coughs> at maghrib time. So you eat whatever you can and then you go and pray. <coughs> then the sheikh says, well, who also, a person shouldn't attend the masjid. A person shouldn't his start should not start his salah whilst in need of going to the toilet. A person should not go to the salah should not start his salah whilst he needs to go to the bathroom because he's not going to have khushur. Because he's not going to have khushur. What should he do? Go to the bathroom and. Then perform wudu and then come into the masjid or come into the line and pray the salah. It is better for you to miss one rak'ah or two rak'ah than to pray four rak'ah without any khushu' and not knowing whether you've read the fatiha or not, whether you've done a record or not. Right. That also goes for anything else that can distract you. For example, you walk into the masjid and you remember that you did not close your, you lock the door, uh, lock the car door. Or you remember that you left your phone on the on the seat in the mess in the car. Don't say that the iqam is going or the imams in the salah already. I need to start the salah. La. Go back, lock the door, get your phone out, and then come back into the masjid. Why? Because if you do go into the masjid and you know your car's open or you've left your phone in the um, on the seat during the whole salah, you'll be thinking about your phone. Has it been broken into? Has the car been broken? Has the phone been... That's all you're going to be thinking about. <coughs> so go back, lock the door, get your phone out, and then come and start with the Imam. Otherwise you won't have any khushur. طيب. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praise those people or the Muslims that have, the believers that have khushur in this. Salah. Allah Jalla says, says, قَدْ, قد أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ Verily, the believers are the successful ones. الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ Those believers, who are they? What are their awsaf? What are their traits? That they have khushur in their salah. And there are things that can help us have khushur, attain khushur in the salah. First and foremost, make dua that Allah Jalla wa ala grants you khushur in your salah. Also, to try and learn the meaning of the verses that the Imam is reading with, especially in Salat al Tagawih, for example, whereby we know where the Imam is going to read tomorrow. Because the majority of, time, of the time, one juz is read a night or half a juz. So read in advance, read in advance. Also pray in a place where you know you won't be distracted. So if you pray near the door and you know there's people going in and out, you're going to be distracted. Like if you pray in the front row, second row, third row, you're going to have more khushur. Then the Sheikh says, Rahimahullah, وَيَنْظُرُ فِي قِيَامِهِ إِلَى مَوْضِعِ سُجُودِهِمْ The next masala that the Sheikh mentions is where to look when you're in your salah. We've said Allahu Akbar, we've had our intention, we've said Allahu Akbar, we've put our hands on now. Uh, on top of the right hand, on top of the left hand. Where should we look now? The Sheikh says, Rahimahullah, you look wherever you're performing the sujood. Your sujood is where you look into. And that is for the whole, for the remainder of the salah, for the duration of the whole salah, whether you're standing, whether you're in a court, you uh, face. Or you look into it, the mawdu sujood, the place where your sujood is. Except when you're in tashahud. When you're in tashahud, you look at your finger. You look at your hand when you're in tashahud. Then the Shaykh says, Rahimahullah, wa la yaltifitu yameenan wa la yasaran fa inna lilzifati ikhtilasun yakhtalisun shaytanun min salati al-abd. The Shaykh says, Rahimahullah, when a person is praying, they shouldn't look around. They should not look around. Left and right, because that is, in reality, the shaitan snatching away his salah. The shaitan is snatching away his salah. So that is muharram, it is not permissible. Like if a person does look left and right, without, without having a legitimate reason, then his salah is valid. Like in their blameworthy. So for example, just looking left and right for the sake of it. Like if a person needs to look left or in any other direction, for a need, for example, you see a child falling into, uh, I don't know, fall into a fire, wherever it may be, then you turn towards them and move them away. 
طيب. Also, there's a difference between looking away with your head and looking away with your whole qibla, looking away from the whole qibla. If a person turns away from the qibla, then their salah is invalid. If they're able to stand and face the qibla, and they turn away from the qibla in totality, then their salah is invalid. So the sheikh is only talking about if you are moving your head towards the two sides. Then the sheikh says, It is not permissible that a person looks into this, looks up. It is not permissible that a person looks up during the salah. And the Prophet said, The Messenger gave a severe warning. He said, Verily, people will refrain from looking up during the salah or their eyesight will be snatched and taken away from them. This shows that it is a major sin because in the Quran and the Sunnah, if you ever find that there's a sin, that a punishment or a curse that has been mentioned for a sin, then know that that sin is a major sin. So the, looking up into the sama or looking up during the salah is a major sin that a person should not do. And it takes away the khushu' that a person, the humility and being attentive in the salah. Dua al-istiftah. The Sheikh says, Rahimahullah. Thumma yastiftah al-qira'ata bi ba'd al-ad'iyyat al-thabitat an al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa hiya kathiratun ashawha. Tayyip. We've said Allahu Akbar. We had the intention to pray. We said Allahu Akbar. We've put our hands on top of one another. Tayyip. The next thing that we should do is start off with Dua al-istiftah. The opening Dua. It is called an opening Dua. So with the opening du'a, right, it is a sunnah. The opening du'a is a sunnah. And there are uh, many ways or many different narrations that have come with regards to how to make the du'a. From them the sheikh says, Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdika wa tabaraka smuka wa ta'ala jadduka wa la ilaha ghaybuka. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is being praised. And Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik Oh Allah, you are free from Exalted you are And you are free from all imperfections And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala You I praise And your name is blessed And your uh, The great and exalted is your kingdom And there is none that has the right to be worshipped Except you This dua Is one of the duas that Should be recited When you're starting your salah The opening dua there are several other du'as. Go back to Hisn al-Muslim and you should find, inshallah, you shall find all of the other types. And the sunnah is what? With regards to the recitation of these du'as? Switch around. Switch around. The sunnah is to switch around. Sometimes read this du'a. Allahumma And so on. So switch around and make sure you read this at times and this at times. Like in any one salah, there's one du'a, opening du'a. وقد ثبت الأمر به طيب who reads the salah who reads the opening dua everyone whether you're the imam whether you're being led by the imam you're praying behind the imam or whether you're praying alone whether you're the imam you're praying behind the imam or you're praying alone There's one scenario that you don't need to or that you shouldn't read the Fatih, that you shouldn't read the opening dua. And that is if you walk into the masjid and the imam is in a record and you've only got a few seconds to read the Fatiha. Or you've only got a few seconds to join the salah. And you know that this imam is gonna he's gonna rise up any minute. He's gonna get up any minute. So if you come into the masjid and he's already in record, the imam, you say Allahu Akbar, and then you go down for record immediately. You don't say Allah. You don't say Allahu Akbar. Subhanak Allah Why not? I'm gonna miss it. Hmm? No, nah, because you're gonna miss the rak'ah. You're gonna miss a whole rak'ah. Don't forget, reading the du'a is a sunnah. So it is not worth missing a whole rak'ah for. So it is more. It is more important that you reach that rak'ah then reciting the opening du'a that is if you haven't got enough time if you haven't got enough time to read the opening du'a طيب. then the shaykh says he's now starting off with the qira'ah 
we've said subhanakallah, we've said the opening dua, what's next? The Shaykh says, Rahimahullah, Thumma yasta'idu billahi wujuban wa ya'tamu bitankihi. The next thing is that he says, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani rajeeb. He seeks refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from shaytan, the cursed and the rejected. Based on the verse of Allah jalla wa ala, Fayda qaratan al-Qur'an, Fasta'id billahi min ash-shaytani rajeeb. Based on the verse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where Allah jalla wa ala says, if you read the Qur'an, meaning if you intend to read the Qur'an, then seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from shaytan, the cursed. The one that has been cursed and the one that has been moved away from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the person says this after the opening dua. So the order is takbiratul ihram, that very first one, Allahu Akbar. Then you say what? The opening dua, subhanakallah mubhan. Then you say, A'udhu billahi min shaytani rajeem. Because by you saying A'udhu billahi min shaytani rajeem, that is now preparing you for your recitation of what's to come after that. طيب, so you say, A'udhu billahi min shaytani rajeem. Wa sunnatu an yaqula, and the sunnah is an yaqula targetan that he says. So now he's going to mention several different ways of saying A'udhu billahi min shaytani rajeem. The first is A'udhu billahi min shaytani rajeem min hamzihi wa nafkhihi wa nafih wa nafthihi. That is the first way of saying A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaytani Rajeem. So there are three ways. The first is just to say A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaytani Rajeem. As you can see in the verse. That you say A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaytani Rajeem. The second method that the Shaykh mentions, which is also a sunnah, is A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaytani Rajeem. I seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from Shaytan, the rejected one, Min Hamzihi, from his insanity, from his arrogance, and from his evil poetry. That is the second method of saying the isti'adah, of seeking refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَطَارَةً يَقُولْ And at times, other times he says, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ سَمِعِ الْعَلِيمِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ وَجِيمِ مِنْ هَمْزِهِ إِلَىٰ آخِرِ لَهِ Up until the last dua that we just said. So what has the third method increased? أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ I seek refuge in Allah. السَّمِعِ الْعَلِيمِ The all-hearing, the all-knowing. I seek refuge in Allah. جل وعلا. The all-hearing and the all the, the, the all-knowing from the shaitan so these are three ways that the shaykh says rahimahullah that the muslim should read in the salah so sometimes read a'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim alone sometimes a'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim min hamzihi wa nafqi and sometimes a'udhu billahi sameen alim min shaitan rajim so all of these three one three different isti'adat are from the sunnah then the Sheikh says, Rahimahullah, Thumma yaqulu sirran fil jahriyati wa sirriyati. Bismillahi rahman rahim After saying the open, saying Allahu Akbar, the opening dua, and then what? A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani rajim. Then you say, Bismillahi rahman rahim Then you say, Bismillahi rahman rahim You're seeking the aid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the blessing in the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most merciful. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لكن الشيخ سيد ثم يقول سرا في الجهرية والسرية لكن he says it quietly الشيخ سيد رحمه الله he says it quietly بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم so whether you're the imam or whether you're praying behind the imam or whether you're again praying alone in all, so, in all, <coughs> in all three circumstances you Say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. You say it to yourself. Whilst moving your lips, lakin, not saying it out loud, not saying Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Lakin, sometimes the person that is leading the salah can say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim in order to teach the people behind him that he's actually said Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Because when he says Allahu Akbar and then he says Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alamin, the people behind him, if they do not know, they may think that he's left out the Bismillah. He hasn't even said Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. He's understood. So if you're praying behind the Imam at times, it is a Sunnah to say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim so that they know that it is that they should be reading Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Like in the Sunnah is that when you're reading the Fatiha or you start your Salah off with the Fatiha. Anas radiallahu anhu, he says that he prayed behind Abu Bakr, he prayed behind the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa and he prayed behind Abu Bakr and he prayed behind and he prayed behind Umar radiallahu anhu and they would start their salah off with Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen meaning they would start their recitation with Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen is that understood? 
طيب so that goes for all types of salah whether it's jahriya jahriya is the salah maghrib fajr and isha jahriya is those salawat that you read out loud loud salatul jahriya is the salah that you read out loud isha fajr and maghrib and salatul sirriya is the salah that you read quietly to yourself nay salatul dhuhr and salatul asr then the sheikh says rahimahullah thumma yaqra surah al fatiha bi tamamiha wal basmalah والبسمنة منها والبسمنة منها وهي ركن لا تصح صلاة إلا بها فيجب على الأعاجم حفظها. The next مسألة the Sheikh says رحمه الله he says it is واجب or it is a pillar to read the Fatiha. After saying بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم the next thing that the person should read or the next surah is the Fatiha. الحمد لله رب العالمين completely he says from beginning to end and it is a pillar. What does this mean that it is a pillar? It is compulsory for you to read. It is compulsory for you to read. The Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "La salat liman lam yaqra fatiha bi fatiha al-kitab." There is no salah for the person who doesn't read the fatiha of the kitab, the opening of the kitab, which is Surah al-Fatiha. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam also said, "Man salla salat lam yaqra fiha bi fatiha al-kitab." Whomsoever prays the salah. And he doesn't read the Fatiha of the Kitab, means Surah Al-Fatiha, فَهِيَ خِدَاجٌ فَهِيَ خِدَاجٌ خِدَاجٌ غَيْرُ تَمَامٌ Then it is naqis, it is deficient. And the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam never left out the reading of the Fatiha. Is that understood? The next masala is, who reads the Fatiha? The answer is, the Imam reads the Fatiha. The one praying behind the Imam also needs to read the Fatiha. And the one that is praying alone also needs to read the Fatiha. Why am I mentioning all three? Because each three, or every one of them, has different ahkam, has different rulings pertaining to them. Like in, in this specific ruling, which is reading the Fatiha, they are the same. So they read the Fatiha. Whether you're the Imam, you need to read the Fatiha. Whether you're praying behind the Imam, or whether you're praying alone. Is understood. Lakin, if the person that is leading the salah, if he doesn't read the fatiha, then that rakha is invalid until he goes back and reads it. Is understood. So, for example, our Imam says, "Allahu Akbar, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim." Ulhu Allahu Ahad Allahu Samad. What has he left out? The fatiha. That rakha, that unit, is invalid until he reads the fatiha. So, for example, if he remembers that he hasn't read the Fatiha whilst reading Surah Al-Ikhlas, خلاص, he finishes Surah Al-Ikhlas, then he reads the Fatiha. Then he reads the Fatiha. Or if he remembers whilst in a Rukur that he did not read the Fatiha, he goes back immediately and reads the what? The Fatiha. That is who? The Imam. The same goes for the person that is praying alone. The same goes for the person that is praying alone. Also, the person that, as for the person that is praying behind the Imam, first and foremost, it is wajib for him to read it. Read what? Fatiha. Read the Fatiha. Like in the unlikely event where he forgets to read the Fatiha, then that mistake of his is covered by the Imam. That mistake of his is covered by the Imam. Obviously, he shouldn't intentionally leave it out. Like in, let's say he forgot for whatever reason to read the Fatiha. That mistake of his is covered by the Imam. طيب. So the next message the Shaykh mentioned is the reading of the Fatiha. Uh, then he also says that Bismillah, the Bismillah is from the Fatiha. Like in the Bismillah Rahman Rahim is not from the Fatiha. Obviously, a difference of opinion amongst the scholars. Like in the stronger opinion is that Bismillah Rahman Rahim is an independent ayah of the Quran that is used to separate between different surahs. And every single surah. Has Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim apart from Surah Tawbah or Surah Al-Bara'ah. Apart from this Surah, every other Surah has Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim and it is to separate between the Surahs and the companions are the ones that put it in the Mus'haf. So if it wasn't part, if it wasn't an independent verse on its own, then it wouldn't have been put in the Mus'haf. Like it is not part of the Fatiha. It is not part of the Fatiha. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I have divided the Salah between me and my servant. And then Allah says, 
if my servant says alhamdulillah rabbil alamin my servant has praised me so in allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this hadith al-qudsi mentions that the fatiha has been separated between allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his servant so the first three or four verses the servant is praising allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in the end of the surah the muslim is what making dua to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala al mustaqim sirat al ladina an'amta alayhim so he's making dua to the to, to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Where's the mahal shahid the point of evidence of mentioning this hadith? The fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala started with Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Did not start with Bismillah Rahman Rahim. The next masala that the Shaykh Rahimahullah mentions is فَمَنْ لَمْ يَسْتَطِعْ أَجْزَاءُهُ أَنْ يَقُولَ سُبْحَانَ اللَّهُ وَالْحَمْدُ لِلَّهُ وَلَا إِلَهِ لَلَّهُ وَاللَّهُ أَكْبَرُ وَلَا حَوْلُ وَلَا قُوتِ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ so the last masala he said was it is wajib upon everyone even those that don't know Arabic to memorize it the Fatiha first and foremost it is wajib to memorize the Fatiha like in the Shaykh is saying in point 51 if a person is not able to read the Fatiha let's say now we have a new Muslim a person that has been a Muslim a week and they haven't memorized the Fatiha what should they do the Shaykh is saying they can say Subhanallah, Walhamdulillah, Walla ilaha illallah, Wallahu akbar, Walla hawla, Walla quwwata illa. That's all they need to say. Obviously, they say Allahu akbar. Like instead of reading the Fatiha when they're on their own, because they can't read the Fatiha, they say this hadith or this dua that the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam taught us. Subhanallah, Walhamdulillah. Right. So, with regards to reading the Fatiha, if it's one of four types. يَقْرَأَ الفاتحة. If a person is able to read the Fatiha, they read what? They read the Fatiha. If a person hasn't memorized the Fatiha, or Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, in totality, like they've memorized two or three or four verses from it, then they read that. That's the second scenario. The third scenario is, if they haven't memorized the Fatiha, but they've memorized other surahs, other surah from the Qur'an, what should they do? They should read the, whatever surah they've memorized. Is this possible? Where a person doesn't memorize the Fatiha but they've memorized other parts of the Quran? Yeah. Of course it's possible. A person, which is shorter? Inna a'tayna kal kawthar or al Fatiha? Al kawthar is shorter. Well, Asr is shorter. So it may be that this person finds it easier to memorize this surah than that surah, than the Fatiha. So if that is the case, the third scenario is that they read the fact that, that whatever they've memorized from the Quran. Because the Prophet said to that companion who he was teaching how to say, how to pray, then read that which you memorize or that which is easy for you from the Quran. That's the third scenario. The fourth scenario is this scenario where a person doesn't know the fact and he doesn't know anything else from the Quran or the Sunnah. Uh, he doesn't know any other verse from the Quran or any other surah. What does he do? He says, La ilaha illallah, or oh, subhanallah, alhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah. Like, and this doesn't mean he stays like that and he just carries on reading this. Like, he has to memorize the Fatiha as soon as possible. He has to memorize the Fatiha as soon as possible. They can't speak in their language. They can't speak in their language in the Salah. A person cannot speak any language other than Arabic, other than Arabic inside the Salah. Because if it was permissible, the Prophet would have allowed him to say Allahu Akbar and he would have allowed him to praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his own language. Like in the fact that the messenger diverted him to say, or told him to say, SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah, Wallahi, Ilaha, Ilaha, Allahu Akbar, is a, shows that we cannot use, or we cannot say any other dua, in, or any other language in the Salah. We cannot say or pray the Salah with any other language other than Arabic. And people often ask, can they read any other duas in their language in sujood? The answer is no. The Salah... You can only read du'as that have been narrated in the Qur'an or the Sunnah or du'as that are in Arabic. Like, and as for speaking your language, then, uh, then no. Then the Shaykh says, Rahimahullah, وَالسُنَّةُ فِي قِرَاءَتِهَا يَقْطِعَهَا آيَةً آيَةً يَقِفُ عَلَىٰ رَأْسِ كُلِّ آيَةٍ فَيَقُولْ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ So now that he said, the Shaykh Rahimahullah, that we read the Fatiha or we say Takbir al-Tahram, Allahu Akbar. We put our right hand on top of our left hand and we say A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem Then what? Then Bismillah Rahman Rahim And then the Fatiha He's telling us how to read the Fatiha He says Rahimahullah We should read it Once stopping at the head of every ayah 
So he says, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, and he stops. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ar Rahmanir Rahim, Maliki Yawmiddin, and so on and so forth. Stop, whereby you stop at every verse. So that is the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If a person doesn't do that, they're not sinning. Again, the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is to read every surah, every verse on its own. ثم يقف ثم يقول ثم يقول وهكذا إلى آخره وهكذا كانت قراءة النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يقف على رؤوس الأولى يسلمها بعدها وإن كانت متعلقة بالمعنى. So the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم would read like that even if the meaning was similar or even if the meaning was connected. So for example, فويل للمصلين الذين هم عن صلاتهم ساهون. Woe well, unto those that those that forget and those that turn away from the remembrance of Allah سبحانه وتعالى. Those who pray their salah. Once they're in a state of lack of khushur, they have no idea what they're praying. So the verses are connected, sah? Lakin, the Prophet ﷺ would still stop at the head of every ayah. فَوَيْلُ لِلْمُصَلِّينَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنْ صَلَاتِهِمْ Like that. So he wouldn't connect it just because they had the same meaning. Then the Shaykh says, رَحِمَهُ وَيَجُوزِ قِرَأَتُهَا مَالِكِ يَوْمِ الدِّينَ and مَلِكِ يَوْمِ الدِّينَ So the Shaykh says, رَحِمَهُ اللَّهِ When you read مَالِكِ يَوْمِ الدِّينَ You're allowed to say, Malik Yawm al-Din, which is the qira'ah that is common amongst us, Hafs and Asim, Malik Yawm al-Din, or Malik Yawm al-Din, which is the qira'ah to worship, I believe this. Malik Yawm al-Din. So you can say this or that. Lakin, when you're reading this, or when you're applying this sort of sunnah, you have to take into consideration the people praying behind you. If you're praying behind the people who've never heard that there's other recitations and you read in a recitation other than the recitation that they're used to they'll think you've changed the salah and they may think that they need to repeat their salah uh, and it happens sometimes you may be praying behind the imam and he reads in another recitation another qira'a which is from the authentic qira'at lakin the people behind them are not used to that so sometimes a person may come to you and say, is our salah correct? I don't know what he was reading, the recitation that he was reading. Is our salah correct? So you have to know the people that are praying behind you and you have to be able to take into consideration whether they're able to understand this or not. Don't teach them something or don't do something that you haven't taught them. For example, the adhan, the adhan that we're used to now. There's probably only one type of adhan that is done everywhere in the world now. Like in, there are other forms of adhan. It is said in other ways. So if you say, if you find that in one of the hadiths and then you say, right, I'm going to go to the masjid and I'm going to do a different adhan people are going to look at you like you're crazy What's he doing? <laughs> they're going to call the adhan again <laughs> After you call the adhan, they're going to call the adhan again So do not confuse the people with that which they're not used to Teach them first and then apply that sunnah Qira'at al muqtadi Then the shaykh says, rahimahullah Then the shaykh says, rahimahullah What time is the jama'ah? So? 7.15, we're going to stop saying 15.00. Then the Imam. The next message that the Shaykh is saying is, with regards to the Fatiha, everyone should read the Fatiha. Everyone should read the Fatiha, whether it's uh, in the silent prayer or the loud prayer. Which is the loud prayer? Maghrib, Isha and Fajr. Illam yasma' qira'at al-Imam. If he doesn't hear the recitation of the Imam. So the Shaykh is saying, for Dhuhr and Asr, if you're praying behind the Imam, then always say the Fatiha. This is the opinion of Shaykh Nasir. If you're praying behind the Imam and you're praying Dhuhr or Asr, or you're praying the last two rak'at of uh, Isha or the last rak'at of Maghrib, then you read it, read the Fatiha. Like in, as for the loud prayers that you read out loud, if you're not able to hear the Imam, the Shaykh is saying, Rahimahullah, uh, the Shaykh is saying, Rahimahullah, that you should listen to the Imam. In these loud salahs, مثلا, Salat al Maghrib and Salat al Isha. Salat al Isha, Salat al Maghrib and Salat al Fajr. If you can hear the Imam, then don't read anything. The Shaykh is saying, Rahimahullah. Like if you can't hear the Imam, for whatever reason, maybe the microphone is not loud enough, maybe the electricity has gone off, or maybe the message is just big. 
If you can't hear the Imam he's saying even in these salahs, then you read out the read out the Fatiha on your own. Right. Right. Like in reality, there's another opinion which is stronger, which is that you read the Fatiha no matter what. Whether you're praying behind the Imam, whether you are the Imam, whether you're praying alone, and whether you're in Salatul Isha or Salatul Dhuhr al Asr. Is that understood? So reading the Fatiha is a pillar that everyone should read. Then the Sheikh says, Rahimahullah, Qira'at ba'd al Fatiha. As for the recitation after the Fatiha, he says, Wa yusamnu an yaqra' bi Fatiha, ba'd al Fatiha, Surat al Ukhra, hatta fi Salat al Janaza, or ba'd al Ayati fi Rakatain ul Yayni. The next message that the Sheikh is referring to is, after you've read the Fatiha, the Sunnah is to read another Surah. In all of the salawat, the first two rakat of Isha, or let's start with Duhur. The first two rakat of Duhur, if you're the Imam or you're praying alone, then you read the Fatiha and another surah. That is for the first two rakat of Duhur. Again, the first two rakat of Asr, the first two rakat of Maghrib, where the Imam is going to be reading out loud. The, the Sunnah is that the Imam reads the Fatiha and another surah. Salat al Isha, likewise. And likewise for Salat al-Fajr, which is two rakat. So the Sunnah is that the Imam reads the Fatiha and another Surah. Like if he doesn't read another Surah and he just says Alhamdulillah, once he finishes, he goes down, then he hasn't left anything out in the Salah that he was meant to do. He's left out a Sunnah. So that doesn't mean that his Salah is deficient or his Salah is not valid. So it is a Sunnah, the Shaykh says, Rahimahullah, uh, to read another Surah. After the Fatiha. Then he says, Rahimahullah, we do not care about the Ahyan, we are sure of Ahyan and Yahagi, the suffering, or Suharin, or Magdin, or Bukai Sabi. Then the Sheikh says, Rahimahullah, with regards to how long your recitation is, sometimes you prolong the recitation and sometimes you shorten the recitation. He's going to talk about the, this masala in detail in a bit. Lakin, this is like an introduction where he's saying, with regards to the recitation, Sometimes he would sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prolong the salah and sometimes he would shorten the salah due to something that has occurred whether it's because they're traveling he shortens the salah or whether it's because of him coughing sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and not being well or whether it's due to an illness or whether it's due to him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam hearing a child crying from the back of the masjid so he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam one time heard a baby that was crying and he shortened the salah, he read, I, think, I believe it was Fajr, and he read uh, He shortened it extremely And then they asked him why, and he said that there was a child that was crying And it may be that his mother is with him, or his mother is busy or preoccupied with him So that shows that the Messenger وسلم, was merciful to his whole Ummah And that is how an Imam should be, anyone that's leading the people in salah he should take into consideration their situation, who they are, whether they can take it or not. Like if he's a fit young man and he says, right, for Salat al Matal and Salat al Maghrib, I'm going to pray Surah al Baqarah, complete Surah al Baqarah, and then in the second rakah, Surah al Anfal, it's impossible. They're going to leave the Salah. And that is the Sunnah of the Prophet to take the people behind you into consideration. Mu'ad radiallahu anhu, he would often pray Isha with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in the Prophet's masjid. And then he would go back and lead his people in the masjid. He would lead his, lead his people in, in their area. So he would read a long surah. Like in on one occasion, a young man who was praying behind him, he left the salah, he carried on, he completed his salah and he left. And they called him a munafiq, a hypocrite, because he left the salah of Mu'ad radiallahu anhu. And then he said, verily you'll see who the, uh, who the munafiq is. Anyway, he went to the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he said, Ya Rasulullah, Mu'ad prays with you. And then he comes back to us, late as it is, and then he wants to lead us with Salat al-Baqarah, Surah al-Baqarah. So he said, that is, what is, that is concerning. He cannot be praying with you, Coming to us late as it is, and then on top of that, praying Salat uh, al-Baqarah. 
So the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said to Mu'ad, Afatanun unto ya Mu'ad, he rebuked Mu'ad. He said that you're putting the people into fitna. So it's important that you take the people behind you into consideration. Likewise, even when you're traveling, take into consideration the weak, the people that may not be able to keep up. Take them into consideration. Then the Sheikh says, Rahimahullah, وَتَخْتَلِفُ الْقِرَاءَةُ بِاخْتِلَافِ الصَّلَوَاتِ He says there's a difference between the recitation with regards to the differing of the salah. فَالْقُرْآنُ فَالْقِرَاءَةُ فِي صَلَاةِ الْفَجْرِ أَطْوَلُ مِنْهَا فِي صَارِ الصَّلَوَاتِ الْخَمْسِ So he says, now he's telling us which prayers are long or should be long and which prayers shouldn't be long. He says, Rahimahullah, Salatul Fajr is longer than all of the other salawat. The salah of the Fajr, the recitation of the Fajr is longer than all of the other salawat. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that the Qur'an is mashhud. The Qur'an that is being read in there. The Quran that is being read in the Salatul Fajr. Aqim Salat al Duluk Shams ila Rasak al Layl Quran al Fajr. In the Quran al Fajr, it can be mashhuda. Allah Jalla wa Ala said that the Quran that is read in the morning prayer is witnessed by the angels. Is witnessed, witnessed by the angels. Then he says Sum al Dhuhr. Then in terms of how long they are, the first is or the longest is what Salat al Fajr. Then Salat al Dhuhr. Then Salat al Dhuhr. Some of the companions would say that we would hear the adam being the iqama being called and the messenger starting the salah, then one of us would go to the baqiq, go to the bathroom, then go back home, make wudu, and then come back to the masjid. And the messenger is still وسلم, in the first raka'ah. Which shows that salatul dhuhr is long or should be long. The first two raka'at should be long. Type. Thum al asr. And then Asr, then the Asr prayer, ثم العشاء, ثم المغرب. And the shortest Salah is Maghrib. Lakin, with regards to Dhuhr, you need to take into consideration the time. You need to take into consideration those people that are praying behind you. For example, مثلا, <coughs> if you've got a masjid, and the masjid is surrounded by many offices, and about 80% of the people that are praying in the masjid have got that half an hour off. Half an hour lunch to come and pray in the masjid. If you say khalas, the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ is that I prolong the dhuhr prayer. And you pray with, mathalan, a very long surah. Is that in, does that benefit them or does that harm them? Oh, that harms them. So you shouldn't be upon a fitna for them. They want to pray the salah. They want to pray within that half an hour slot that they have. They've made the effort of coming to the masjid. So you, at the very least, as the imam, need to take that into consideration. The same thing goes for the khutbah. The sunnah as it is, is to make the khutbah very short anyway. Like when you're leading the people in salah, you need to take into consideration the people that are praying behind you. Fine. Mathalan, for example, even salat al taraweeh Even salam wa alaykum. We'll continue on that now, inshallah, after salat al Asha. So we'll just finish off in about five minutes the part to do with the recitation of the Prophet ﷺ in the Salah. The last issue we talked about was uh, to take into consideration the people praying behind you. So for example, if you're the Imam and there are people praying behind you, you have to take into consideration the situation of these people. For example, if they're rushing back to work and they've only got a certain period of time, limited amount of time, it's not correct to lead them with Surah Al-Baqarah and say that the Sunnah is that you prolong the Salah. Likewise, even with Salat Al-Taraweeh, especially when Isha prays is late, Isha is late and Taraweeh is even later, and the people have got work or college or uni in the morning, it's not correct to prolong the Salah because that would be a burden on them. That may cause them to not come to the Salah in totality. Lacking, for example, if tomorrow is a Saturday and if tomorrow is a Sunday, if it's a weekend, then prolonging the salah it might be understandable. Lacking, it's important that the Imam takes into consideration the people praying behind him. Then the Sheikh says, Rahimahullah, Wal qira'atu fi salati layli atwalu min dhalika kullihi. He says, As for salatul layl, the night prayer, that is longer than all of the other salawat, zuhur, asr, and maqib, and so on. Why? Because when you're praying salatul layl, often you're praying at home and you're praying alone. So you can read whatever you wish. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam recited Surah Al-Baqarah, Al-Nisa'a, Al-Imran and Surah Al-Baqarah in one raka'ah. 
to the extent that Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, he, tried, he considered even leaving the salah due to him, yani, because the standing was so long. Like when you're praying alone, you can do what you want. وَالسُنَّةُ إِطَالَةُ إِطَالَةُ الْقِرَاتِ فِي رَاكَةِ الْأُولَى أَكْثَرُ مِنْ ثَانِيَةِ So the Sheikh says the Sunnah is that you make the first raka'ah longer than the second raka'ah. So let's say for example you're praying Salat al-Isha. The Sunnah is the first raka'ah of Salat al-Isha, you make it, however long you make it, you make sure that the second raka'ah is shorter than the first raka'ah. وَأَنْ يَجْعَلَ الْقِرَاتَ فِي الْأُخْرَيَيْنِ أَقْصَرَ مِنَ الْأُولَيَيْنِ قَدْرَ النِّسْفِ uh, the recitation should be shorter in the second raka'ah. As for the last two raka'at, you're only going to read the Fatiha in most cases anyway. Then the Sheikh says, وَتَجِبُ قِرَاءَةُ الْفَاتِحَةِ فِي كُلِّ رَكْعَةِ And it is wajib to read the Fatiha in every single raka'ah. If you're praying Dhuhr, the first, the second, up until the fourth one. Likewise, if you're praying Salat al-Maqib, or whatever Salat you're praying, whether you're the Imam, the one praying behind the Imam, or if you're praying alone, then you make sure you read the Fatiha. Then the Sheikh says, رَحِمَهُ اللَّهُ وَيُسَنُّ زِيَادَةُ عَلَيْهَا فِي رَكْعَتَيْنِ الْأَخِيرَتَيْنِ أيضاً أحياناً. Sometimes, sometimes what the person can do is the second two rak'at or the last two rak'at for Zuhr and the last two rak'at for Asr and the last two rak'at for Isha and the last rak'at for Maghrib, you can read an extra surah. Fatiha and another short surah. Like that is only sometimes. وَلَا يَجُوزْ إِطَالَةُ الْإِمَامِ الْقِرَاءَةَ بِأَكْثَرِ مِمَّا فِي السُنَّةِ فَإِنَّهُ يَشُقُّ بِذَلِكَ عَلَى مَنْ قَدْ يَكُونُ وَرَاءَهُ then the Sheikh says, Rahimahullah, in the Masala 63, he says, it is not permissible to prolong the Salah more than which has, that which has been narrated in the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu For example, Mu'ad radiallahu anhu, he used to lead the companions or lead his people. He used to pray Salat al-Baqarah, read Salat al-Baqarah, Surat al-Baqarah in Salat al-Isha. The Prophet Sallallahu prohibited him from that. And he said, why don't you read Sabih Isma Rabbik al-A'la? So reading Sabih Isma Rabbik al-A'la wa Shamsi wa Duhaha wa Al-Buruj and these sort of surahs in Salat al-Isha is reasonable. Um, na'am, wa yajha wa al-Baqarat fi Salat Subh al-Na'am. Then the Shaykh in the last few lines he's talking about the uh, the Salah, for example he says that in Salat al the Jum'ah Salah, Salat al-Subh, the morning prayer, Salat al-Isha, Maghrib, the first two rak'at, Eid, uh, Salat al Kusuf, the eclipse prayer, or seeking rain, the stisqa. All of these prayers are to be recited out loud. The recitation is to be out loud. All of these prayers that the Shaykh has just mentioned. Naam. As for Dhuhr and Asr, then the person reads them out. The Muslim, they read them quietly. Uh, naam. And he says, <laughs> Sometimes the Imam can say one or two verses out loud. So that he lets the people behind him know that he's reading something. As for witter, he says, Rahimahullah, sometimes you can read it out loud and at other times you read it out quietly. You read it to yourself and other times you read it out loud. Uh, so the last few masalas is, a sunnah is to read the Quran in moderation, slowly and not to recite fast. Not too slow and not too fast. الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين That is fairly moderate ترتيل لكن to say الحمد لله رب العالمين مالك الدين يكلم دين Obviously you won't have خشوع The people behind, praying behind you won't know what you're reading So the idea is that or The wisdom is that people behind you They know what you're reading And every single harf or letter is You're able to distinguish it from the letter before it And the words that you're saying The people behind you can Understand. Uh, like, and it shouldn't be read out in a tone where it makes it out as if it is nasheed or music. So the Quran should be read in a distinct tone. The last mas'ala that the Sheikh talks about before going into the court, he says, if the Imam makes a mistake, it is wajib for the people praying behind him to correct him. If he makes a mistake. If he makes a mistake. The people praying behind him should correct the Imam. Lakin you shouldn't be hasty in trying to correct the Imam. Sometimes he's gone quiet because he's coughing. Sometimes maybe he's got his, his khushur and his salah and he's crying. And that's why he has stopped reading the Qur'an. That's, that's why he's stopped reciting the Qur'an. It's not because he has forgotten. So it's incumbent upon the people praying behind the Imam not to rush immediately in correcting the Imam. It may not be, it may be that he's not even made a mistake or he knows what he's reading lacking. He's taking his breath. Taking 
a breath or maybe he's in khushu' uh, Naam, we'll just stop on that now inshallah If there are any less questions pertaining or connected to the lesson Then inshallah we can take that